beginning with the assemblage and also using found objects in my own photographs. That was really unexpected for me. Um, and But I've always been a collector of kind of curious objects um, and a lot of vintage, small, strange vintage pieces. And so I've always had them in my home. And there was a day where I went into a friend's office and she had this, she had something on her desk that, you know, struck me right away. It was unbelievably beautiful and I had no idea what it was. And I asked her and she said, oh, it's an owl wing. And I said, an owl wing, like, oh my God. And I wanted her to give it to me and she wouldn't. It was a gift for her. And so she said, but apparently they sell whole intact bird wings at, at sporting goods stores because fishermen like make lures or something out of them. And she was, she didn't even finish the sentence. I was already in my car driving to the nearest sporting goods store where I bought every single bird wing that they sold literally. And I came home and I was needed to make a photograph like so excited I had my favorite wings out and I was trying all kinds of things around the house and I was holding them over my eyes looking in the mirror trying to find the picture my kids were at school no one to work with and it was just um, I walked into my office and on the coffee table was a large print of an image I'd made probably 10 years er earlier. Uh, it was originally called Pissed Off Ballerina, and it was just my daughter, and I think she was four or five at the time, but not too happy about having this picture made, and she's in a tutu. But it was like this gravitational pull, and I just walked over and laid the wings down on the print, and then I knew you know, that was gonna be the picture. And so the next morning I got up and I just started pulling prints and pulling objects and seeing these combinations that made an entirely new narrative um, using a mediocre landscape I'd taken 10 years earlier, but all of a sudden there's, there's a child's science project embedded in this landscape. And it was so thrilling. It was one of the most exciting times of my creative life because I would shoot all day with these different combinations until I couldn't stand it and I had to see the film and I'd run down and run the film and I'd get up the next morning and do it and I did that for about four months constantly and I now refer to it as my nonviolent shooting rampage. It was so joyful. I lived um, for about 25 years in Houston, and then um, about 10 years ago, we moved uh, to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and that just uh, turned my whole life into uh, something entirely different. Uh, I had never experienced four seasons. I, I still cry every single time it snows. I don't think I'm ever going to get over it. I had never seen fall with my real eyes. Um, I, I thought maybe I didn't belong to the South, but I started, once I was here, I realized that Texas isn't really the South. Texas is just Texas. And I actually really enjoyed Southern culture and felt like something that I could relate to. And, and that was all those things. Also, I didn't know anyone for a thousand miles. Um, the landscape was entirely different. And that's when I started to make pictures that I really cared about. We did not have extended family. My parents were very young when they got married. They both left hard lives behind and they did not talk about those lives. They didn't talk about relatives. I didn't really know relatives. Um, and so we lived this very isolated life in that way. But my mother had a chest of drawers in the front hall and in the, on the, in the bottom drawer on the left side, it was completely filled with photographs. 
And so it was a regular thing for me. I would just sit down by myself, pull the whole drawer out, just spread the photographs around all around me. And just, I was fascinated by them. And I think the fact that no one was saying, oh, well, that's your Aunt June. And, you know, she was, a, she was the funny one. You know, I didn't know anything about any of them. But I was, and they were mostly in black and white. But I was just looking at, you know, why did this moment matter to this person? You know, that they, they wanted to make sure that they captured that. I, and, then, and then, you know, kind of forced to look at composition and, and the narrative. And, but I could make all of that up for myself because um, we weren't talking about them as a family. But that was really, I, I've come to realize that was kind of the beginning of me falling in love with photography. I've always um, shot with film. And when I, when I really was just beginning, I don't think there was, there, digital, the digital era was not fully formed as it is now. And so I started on film and I really loved I loved uh, the whole process of even just uh, loading the film in the camera. But then the big shift, um, a friend told me one day, he said, well, if you're going to stick with film, if you're a black and white girl and you're going to stick with film, you have to take a darkroom course. And I said, well, I'm never going to be a darkroom girl. That's just not, I just want to make the pictures. and that, I'm not going to like that. And he said, well, it'll make you a better photographer. And I was off to this, you know, signed up and um, took my introduction to darkroom, which was the only darkroom course I ever took. But that I watched that first print come up in that tray of developer, and I thought, yeah, this is me. This is it forever. I'm never going to be anything but this. I, I, it, I say it all the time, but it's, watching a print come up in the tray is not like magic. It is magic. Why? Why wouldn't I want to wake up and go to work in that every day? It's. It's. I'm in awe of the process, actually. So, um, yeah, I'll be the last one standing, but I don't think it's going down like that. Drunken Poet Stream, I spent a lot of time with, and that was um, a lot of turns for me with that project. And there's this wonderful Texas musician. He's one of my favorites. Um, his name is Ray Wiley Hubbard, brilliant songwriter. And I heard this song several years ago, Drunken Poet Stream. It's this crazy good song, but but I thought about those three words together, Drunken Poet Stream. That that sounds sort of beautiful and wonderful and tragic at the exact same time. And I, and then. And then this was the coolest thing. I didn't know where I was going to start or how to how I was going to flesh it out because it can't just be a cool title. It's got to be something true about me and important to me. But I loved it so much and I thought, well, maybe I'll figure it out as if I get started, you know. Um, and so I started making some pictures and I was editing one night and my son, Grayson, uh, who was 10 at the time, came in and I asked him if he would take a look at, at the work and, and I told him what I was working on. I showed him the pictures and he said, this is so my children. He said, I mean, yeah, they're good, but what is it you really want to say with Drunken Poet's Dream? And because it was just me and him, I could have really answered just kind of from my heart and I said, well, you know how a lightning storm is really uncomfortable and really beautiful at exactly the same time. And then it just all like became clear in my mind. And I said, well, think, I could think of lots of things that that's true. Loving someone is uncomfortable and beautiful. Um, you know, having children is uncomfortable and beautiful. Being an artist is uncomfortable and beautiful. So then I knew I was really off to the races. I could, I had something to work on there. I play guitar, not well, but that doesn't stop me. Um, and I love lyrics. I'm, I think words, I do read, I always have, 
And the words for me kind of shape everything I do, whether it's the words in my head, that's the story that I'm telling, or the project title that gets me going in a direction, or, you know, I'd been working on this project with a friend of mine for the last four years um, called Intrusions of Grace. And it was based, it's based entirely on the writing of Flannery O'Connor. And particularly, there's a prose publication, it was a publication of her prose work called Mystery and Manners. And we just took, she, she writes about the craft of writing. And every place where she would talk about a writer or writing, we would replace it with photographer or photography and just started to really uh, connect to that work. And then, you know, these, uh, that she called them grotesques, but sort of these, you know, the freaks that come into the story, but they're actually, you know, every man in some way and recognizing the freak in myself and, and trying to tell that story, but, but gracefully, not for shock value. I'm never in it for shock value. Um, I think it's probably the least interesting way to actually tell a story. Um, but I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Flannery O'Connor that said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. <laughs> well, yeah, that kind of sums it all up for me. It's my favorite sound. I don't know, laughter's pretty good, but that would be a strong second.